Today we're taking a look at an aircraft that has been highly requested by some viewers, but is probably quite unknown to many others. It was one of the few truly large aircraft operated by the German Luftwaffe during the Second World War, the Junkers Ju-290. After the Messerschmitt 323 Gigant, the Ju-290 was the largest land plane to achieve series production in Germany during the war. With a length of 28.6 metres, 94 feet, and a wingspan of 42 metres, or 137 feet 10 inches, it was only a little bit smaller than the Boeing B-29 Superfortress. But unlike the B-29, which was designed from the outset as a long-range strategic bomber, the origins and development cycles of the Ju-290 were far, far messier. Today's video actually looks at three Junkers designs, the Ju-90, the 290, and the 390, as all three are related in this messy history, and because of that it was thought better to cover all three in a single video rather than split the topic. Today's video has also been done in partnership with Icarus Art, a company that makes beautiful aviation themed artworks. Whether you're into Catalinas, Corsairs, Stukas, Spitfires, or Ansons, there's sure to be a piece that takes your fancy, and if not, they're constantly adding new designs and art pieces to their collection. You can purchase them as either printed canvas or posters, and the prices start for as little as $10. Now Icarus kindly sent me over two samples, which you'll see here, along with me and my silliness. Sadly there was some really noisy construction work going on outside my window, so my actual attempts to talk to the camera were a complete failure. The art however wasn't, and it now hangs on my walls with pride. Right now, Icarus currently have a limited edition short Sunderland print for sale, with only 100 copies available, so follow the link in the description to check them out, and use the code REX at the checkout to get 10% off your order. So thank you Icarus for my new eye candy, and now let's get back to the Junkers 290. The story of the Junkers giant goes back to the Ju-90, which itself was an enlarged version of the Ju-89 bomber. The Ju-89 was a mid-1935 contender for the so-called Ural Bomber specification, issued by the RLM, which outlined an aircraft capable of striking targets as far as the Ural Mountains in Soviet Russia from German territory. The Dornier Do-19 was also drawn up to this specification, to which both showed relative promise, and three prototypes of each design were ordered. At this point it must be outlined that a huge part of the support for developing and upgrading the Luftwaffe's fledgling bomber fleet came from General Lieutenant Walter Werber. But this came during a time when the majority of senior Luftwaffe officials wanted to move things away from long-range strategic bombing. It will come as no surprise then that when Weber died in 1936, strategic bombing was swiftly put on the back burner, and the Ural bomber specification was outright cancelled in 1937. This cancellation arose for several reasons, but a big influence was that of Weber's successor, Kesselring, who had a preference for twin-engine medium bombers. This, combined with Ernst Udet's preference for dive bombing, Hermann Goering's preference for more bombers in general, and the doubts about Germany's industrial capacity to build large bombers en masse, essentially killed all development for the Ju-89, which at the time had two prototypes completed and one still under construction. In order for it to not have been a complete waste of time, and money, the Air Ministry did allow Junkers to explore a conversion of the unfinished prototype to a commercial transport version for Lufthansa, designated as the Ju-90. Beginning in April 1936, as a private venture, Junkers began production of the new aircraft, which would eventually total at 16, and, despite its original intent, it would be primarily used by the Luftwaffe whereas only a small amount actually entered Lufthansa service. The wings, control service and landing gear were borrowed from the 89 with no modification, though overall the Ju-90 would be a far more capable aircraft than its predecessor. 
The first flight was undertaken on the 28th of August 1937, with Captain Zimmerman at the controls. Overall, the flight went surprisingly well, with Zimmerman praising its handling characteristics in virtually all stages of flight, and the only major change resulting from early flights was that the vertical stabiliser was slightly enlarged to improve directional stability. However, it wouldn't be long till the project would take a significant blow. The Daimler-Benz DB600 engine, intended to power the aircraft, abruptly ceased production, replaced by the DB601, which had also been exclusively reserved for the BF109 program. As a result, the next two prototypes were hurriedly fitted with BMW 132H engines, a copy of the American Pratt & Whitney Hornet. This was a much less powerful engine, with a takeoff power of 880 horsepower and a constant power of 560. As a comparison, the DB600s had been outputting 1050 horsepower under takeoff and 800 horsepower under normal conditions. So this switch effectively halved the power output of the aircraft and significantly hampered performance. The BMW-powered JU-90, designated as the JU-90B, was, rather predictably, not a stunner in the performance department, and ultimately just eight would be produced. The second blow, which struck the program even harder, followed when a JU-90 in South Africa had two engines on the same side give out during takeoff. This caused a complete loss of control, the aircraft veered off and cartwheeled off the runway, killing six of the nine crew members. Now, some of these men had been the most experienced and skilled pilots in Lufthansa service, and this represented a considerable loss for the company. With the originally intended engines, the first JU-90 performed much better, setting two world records. One was an altitude of 9,312 metres, or 30,500 feet, whilst carrying 5 metric tonnes, or 11,000 pounds of cargo. And the other record was at 7,242 metres, or around 23,700 feet, with 10 tonnes, or 22,000 pounds. These were pretty astonishing numbers for the late 1930s, but with the Daimler-Benz engines out of the question, and the BMW radials clearly not a satisfactory replacement, Junkers turned their gaze elsewhere for a suitable power plant. The new BMW 801 radial, which had been in development for some time, but had only just entered production in 1939, had generated much interest, and Junkers recognised that it could be a perfect match for the JU-90. Outputting 1580 horsepower from 14 cylinders arranged in two rows, the 801 very much represented the forefront of German power plant development at the time. Two JU-90s that had been intended for a Lufthansa service to South Africa, which had been subsequently cancelled after the outbreak of war, gave Junkers two perfect test beds. The first aircraft to be refitted underwent its acceptance flight immediately after the conversion, but aside from the engine swap, it was practically identical to the previous version of the JU-90. Unfortunately, the fact that the BMW 801 was twice as heavy as either of the earlier engines was apparently overlooked, as during the flight, the engine nacelles, and then the wings, and then the fuselage, quite literally fell to pieces, with the 26 meter long aircraft essentially disintegrating in mid-air. The pilot, Captain Kinderman, was completely unable to determine exactly what had happened, and reportedly, in his words, suddenly found himself in the open air with his parachute. Junkers rather sheepishly went back to the drawing board, and made the appropriate changes to the nacelles and airframe that came with adding an extra 2,000 kilograms, and this resulted in the JU-90 V6. On top of the necessary changes, the fuselage was also aerodynamically refined and given modified control services. The V6, and then later the V7, would also see the introduction of the characteristic loading ramp in the aft fuselage. Fully extended, the ramp opened far enough to allow cars, artillery, and even half-tracks to drive in under their own power. This kind of cargo could then be airdropped using specialised parachutes. 
It should be noted that this was a capability that very few German aircraft had at the time, which made the Ju-90 stand out quite a bit. The V-7 was also the first to be properly armed, featuring a hydraulic DL-131 dorsal turret, a glazed rear gunner position with a 7.92mm MG-15, and two MG-81Zs in the under-fuselage gondola, one firing fore and one aft. Numerous prototypes followed, testing more powerful BMW 801 engines, hydraulic flaps, lengthened fuselages, defensive gondolas, and different armament positions, and then the Ju-90 V11, the 11th prototype, was built featuring an offset undernose gondola and a revised tail section. The cumulative changes were deemed enough to warrant a change of designation, and it became known as the Ju-290 V1. Unarmed, the Ju-290 V1 began flight tests in August of 1942, whilst two older Ju-90s were converted into the 290 specification and allotted to the new program as the V2 and V3 prototypes. As a result of the slow but steady stream of work and development on the aircraft, the Ju-290 was ready for pre-production very quickly after its first test flights with the first two A-series Ju-290s rolling off the line at Dassau in October of 1942. These aircraft, known as the Ju-290A0s, were powered by four BMW 801L2 radials, generating up to 1600 horsepower at takeoff, but these remained unarmed and were retained by Junkers for testing purposes. Early 1942 would see the first production aircraft being a batch of five Ju-290A1s. The Ju-290A2 would follow in the summer of 1943, which boasted a substantially more powerful defensive armament, namely the addition of a second hydraulically operated dorsal turret, which housed a 20mm MG-151-20 cannon. The A2s were also fitted with a nose-mounted FUG-200 radar system, which was used to aid in the maritime patrol role in which these aircraft were often used. The A3s, following in late 1943, and of which only five were built, substituted the rear dorsal turret for a more aerodynamic FW-20 turret. The last two A3s were also re-engined with a BMW 801D1, which offered a marginal performance improvement over the previous L2. Autumn 1943 saw the 290A4, which replaced the forward dorsal turret with a low-drag FW19 turret and some refinements to the gondola position as well. The A5 followed in November of the same year, adding self-sealing fuel tanks and significant armour protection for the crew. Out of the 10 produced, the first 9 featured the standard 13mm MG131s in the waist positions, although the last, work number 0180, replaced these with the far more powerful MG15120s. On top of this, Airstream spoilers were added to the turrets to deflect turbulent air away from the guns, and two more crew members were carried. In March 1944, the first production A5 was once again re-engined with BMW 801 TL engines, which featured a lower gear ratio to improve efficiency on larger and heavier aircraft. The A6, of which only one was produced, was initially intended to be a personal transport for Hitler himself, featuring cabin pressurisation and extra armour for the Führer's personal compartment. This 290 would go on to have the distinction of being the last flyable 290, seeing Spanish service in the post-war period. The A7, intended as a reconnaissance bomber, appeared in the spring of 1944 and featured a new glazed nose, which housed a further MG-151-20 cannon. Racks were re-added from the A5 version under the central fuselage and outboard wings, designed to carry either HS-293, HS-294, Fritz X's, or 3,000 kilograms of general ordnance. This aircraft, of which the Luftwaffe had ordered 25, would see only half of these actually completed, prior to the cancellation of all bomber types in favour of the more urgently needed fighters. The A8, of which only one had been produced by the time of the cancellation of all bomber projects, was an exceptionally well-armed aircraft, 
boasting four dorsal turrets, each housing an MG-15120. Then, the oddly numbered A9 had in fact preceded the A7, three examples being produced in January of 1942. These were broadly similar to the A1s, except with a much higher internal fuel capacity, which increased the range up to 8,300 kilometers, or 5,150 miles. The proposed but ultimately non-existent B-series were to be a dedicated long-range strategic bomber variant of the 290, complete with a large internal bomb bay and four 2,000 horsepower BMW 801Es. These aircraft would have had pressurised cockpits and gun turrets, along with the HD-151Z turrets in both of the dorsal positions, which featured a quad 13mm MG-131 layout. At this point, it's also important to briefly touch on the JU-390. The 390 was a fascinating and distinct development of the 290, which essentially involved bolting on two additional engines and enlarging the aircraft to try and increase its huge range even further. Born of a specification calling for a long-range bomber capable of striking New York, the so-called America Bomber program, Junkers was able to quickly throw together the design for the 390, as in many respects it was identical to its smaller brother. The 390 program is fairly shrouded in mystery, and not much is known about it. The first prototype, the V1, was constructed in Dassault and underwent its maiden flight in October of 1943. A second prototype was built in mid-1944, but it never flew. The Japanese had shown a large interest in the project, apparently considering it of utmost importance, though it's not clear why, considering by mid-1944 they had other things to worry about, uh, the US Navy being top of the list, but their interest persisted. Junkers had prepared all of the manufacturing and instructional documents ready to hand over to Japan, but negotiations dragged on and eventually ended in January of 1945, and nothing more came of it. It's unknown whether the V-1 actually flew to Japan for display to officials, or if they both fell victim to Allied bombings later in the war. The aircraft were built with BMW 801Es, though it was intended for the production variants to be powered by six Jumo 223s, 2,500 horsepower diesel engines, and they would give a range upwards of 9,000 kilometers, or just over 5,500 miles. Many secret flights of the 390 have been speculated, most without validity, though one does stick out among them. The story of a secret JU-390 flight to New York dates back to 1955, when the British aviation magazine RAF Flying Review published a report that, early in 1944, two Junkers 390s had conducted a transatlantic flight to within 19 kilometers of the New York coast, then returning to France. The alleged reconnaissance photos taken on this mission have never been found, and no records of the flight exists in German archives. You may have also noted that the report states two 390s conducted the flight, despite the fact that the second prototype never flew, and in early 1944 it hadn't even been built yet. It was a dubious claim, but one that nonetheless has stuck in the field of those interested in the 390, despite there apparently being no real evidence to support it. Moving away from conspiracy, the JU-90 and 290, in all of their variants and versions, would overall leave a fairly modest footprint in the Second World War, with only 18 and 65 being built respectively. Nonetheless, the aircraft represented a capable, fast, modern, and well-defended transport in the early years. In 1940, they would see their first operations with the Luftwaffe, being used as transport aircraft during the short-lived Norwegian campaign, lugging vast quantities of supplies, ammunition, and weaponry from Germany. 
though operational usage would stay modest for the following years, with some supplying the Africa Corps and undertaking general transport duties, use of the aircraft would seriously ramp up in late 1942, as plans were put in place to form a four-engine transport squadron that would be able to supply troops deep in Soviet territory. Seven Ju-90s, two Ju-290s, one Ju-252 and one Fokker-Wolf 200 would make up the unit, flying operations unescorted during the Stalingrad airlift in a desperate attempt to meet the enormous needs of the 200,000 German soldiers encircled there. Deep in Soviet territory, the Ju-90 would be pushed to the edge of its capabilities, and beyond, one such example taking place on January the 13th, 1943. Just three days after arriving at the front, a Ju-290V1, piloted by Captain Hanig, would make a successful landing at Bitomnik, an airfield behind the shrinking German perimeter. The 290 would load up wounded German soldiers on board in an attempt to evacuate them to safety, but tragically, a sharp turn on takeoff caused all 79 wounded troops on board to be thrown to the rear of the plane, causing a vicious and unrecoverable stall. Too low to recover, the 290 was completely destroyed in the ensuing crash, and nobody on board survived. A second Ju-290, an A-0 variant, was dispatched to replace the lost transport days later, but this aircraft was intercepted by Soviet Lag-3 fighters, and it was extensively damaged en route to the German pocket. The damage was so great that the crew decided to abort the mission and return to base for repairs, and by the time it was airworthy again, the Germans had lost the airfield. After the total failure of the Stalingrad airlift, the unit was then sent to the Mediterranean, operating out of Greece. Concurrently, the newer 290s began to take delivery, and were dispatched to FAG-5, the 5th Long Range Reconnaissance Wing, throughout 1943, with their task to be conducting flights over vast swathes of the Atlantic Ocean in the hunt for Allied convoys. Over the course of 30 missions, one 290A2 would log a staggering 120,350 kilometers over just 415 hours. Though, somewhat hilariously, FAG-5 actually determined that even the gargantuan range of the A2, which was over 8,000 kilometers or just under 5,000 miles, was insufficient for Atlantic duties. For A5 variants, which began to equip FAG-5 in late 1943, featured an even longer endurance, and it thoroughly outclassed the Fokker-Wolf 200s it was replacing. In Defensive Armament 2, the A5 was improved, sporting four MG-15120s and four MG-131s. Some of these aircraft with FAG-5 even took delivery of a conversion kit to fit a 30mm MK-103 to the front gondola, with a hydraulic assist for the gunner. This was meant to be used for strafing convoys, although the nature of the 290's operations meant that, more often than not, it shadowed convoys rather than directly attacking them. Though the rate of operations stayed steady for FAG-5, and the Ju-290s were as good an aircraft as they could reasonably hope to operate, less than 10% of targets relayed by 290s were actually destroyed. The low production rate of the aircraft was also a hindrance, as despite its impressive capabilities, only a few 290s were ever operationally on strength with FAG-5 at a given time with the less capable Dornier 217 and Heinkel HE-111 comprising most of their inventory. As a quick aside, in other roles, the long range of the aircraft was also being put to good use, with three A9s participating in ultra-long range missions, transporting valuable cargo from Ukraine to Japanese Manchuria, which was a 7,000 km journey each way. But for the European theatre, D-Day and the wave of Allied troops into France made the Atlantic patrols somewhat redundant, and the mission of FAG-5 was rescinded, and in August 1944 the unit was disbanded altogether. The remaining 290s were scattered around various transport units and theatres of war, with some returning to the Mediterranean, and some being transferred to one KG-200, which was a special operations squadron. 
Six were also requisitioned by Lufthansa, though they would actually remain mostly grounded for the rest of the war, and were almost entirely destroyed by Allied raids on German airfields. KG-200, meanwhile, repurposed some of their 290s for special operations, dropping agents on special missions behind enemy lines. Some 600 of these agents would be delivered by 290s with KG-200 until these missions too were discontinued in early 1945. As the war reached its end years, a few 290s would find themselves with new owners. Late in 1944, one 290A5, left intact at an airfield in Greece, had been captured by Allied forces. The Royal Air Force were briefly interested in taking it home before another 290 was captured by the US, and post-war this aircraft was left in Greek hands. Redesignated as the Archimedes S-1, the aircraft was briefly flown, but quickly grounded after a lack of spare parts before being scrapped sometime after 1949. Back in Germany, Group Commander Heinz Braun would fly his 290A6 to neutral Spain in April 1945, followed by an A9 four days later, with both alighting in Barcelona. The Spanish government would officially purchase the A6, using it as an advanced trainer in their training school, before finally being scrapped in 1952, after serviceability became somewhat of a problem due to a lack of spare parts. In the chaos of the German collapse, another Ju-290 was to fall into Allied hands as well. Encircled by Soviet troops, and not wanting to be captured by the Red Army, a German crew, carrying 80 men, women and children, loaded aboard one of the few large and serviceable aircraft left intact, a Junkers Ju-290A7. Flying low in turbulent weather to avoid Soviet fighters, the aircraft flew westward undetected. After a successful flight, the A7 landed safely in US-occupied Munich. It was then decided to send it back to the States for evaluation at Wright Field. In preparation for the transatlantic flight, the aircraft was given a thorough look over. The electrics, hydraulics and engines were all inspected carefully by both American and German engineers. The German oil was drained and replaced with a corresponding grade of US oil, and two of the BMW engines, which were far more worn out than the other pair, were replaced with two newer ones, one of which was discovered at the bottom of a Parisian swimming pool. Flying from Western France to Bermuda, and then onto Wright Field, the Junkers underwent its test flights in the autumn of 1945. Unfortunately, at this point, the airframe was not put into a museum, as one might have hoped, but it was cut into test sections and later melted down. One considerable shock came when the aircraft was being disassembled. An unexploded dynamite charge was found in the stubborn wing, presumably placed by resistance fighters, and a defective activating pin had preserved the lives of the 80 men, women and children on board the Junkers during its flight to Munich. The final hope to having a surviving 290 came when Czechoslovakian forces discovered a partially constructed A8, which, in conjunction with parts from an unfinished B2, were transferred to the Letov plant where an effort began to reconstruct the airframe after the war. The original propellers, which were missing from both, were substituted with smaller but still functional propellers from four Focke-Wulf 190s. The completed aircraft, dubbed the L290 Oral, or Eagle, underwent its maiden flight on August 1st, 1946. Lasting two hours, the flight was abandoned early as the crew was unable to locate the centre of gravity during trimming tests, and the Orel displayed some instability as a result. Eventually, it returned to the Letov plant where wooden trays containing sandbags were fastened to the floor, and moved around in a more desperate attempt to solve the problem. In 1947, after all attempts had failed, and after just 43 flying hours, the project was abandoned. For the next nine years, the aircraft would sit in various hangars, whilst talks with potential buyers were ongoing, but finally in 1956, with all interest gone, the ill-fated L290 was completely scrapped. This probably marked the last surviving 290 in the world, 
the Yonkers Giants essentially all being shot down, destroyed by bombing raids, or scrapped post-war. Because of the lack of surviving models, and because they were often used in less glorious but still important roles, the Ju-90 and 290 often don't get much attention. For the time, they were large and ambitious aircraft, particularly for a country whose industry preferred more numerous, medium-sized designs. They were also well employed, despite their small numbers, serving roles so widely different as supporting ground troops in Norway, ferrying supplies to Far East Asia, and shadowing convoys in the Atlantic. This, however, also serves to highlight the biggest problem with the Ju-290. It was used piecemeal. It was scattered throughout a multitude of roles that it wasn't actually designed for, being originally planned as an airliner, and any losses were almost impossible to replace. Had they been built in larger numbers, their impact could have been quite profound. But that leads into other questions about Germany's industrial capacity to build something like the 290 in large numbers, which is well beyond the scope of this video. So we'll have to discuss that what-if scenario another day. As always, thank you all so much for watching. And a big thank you, of course, to the patrons, whose names you'll see here. Uh, I apologise if the audio for today's video is a little bit off. I've been struggling this week with my voice. Um, it's been pretty croaky, and I have I think I might be having a bit of a head cold. And I had to redo a lot of the lines in today's video, so if it comes across as a bit janky, it's probably because I had to do about two billion different cuts in Premiere whilst editing the final recording for this. A big thank you, of course, to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier supporters. And I know I keep saying it, but the special video that everyone voted on is coming. There was just a bit of a delay with the editing process. Um, basically, I had to start again from scratch. That should hopefully be done within the next uh, five to seven days, so keep an eye out for that. But as always, thank you all for your continued support, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.